that uh, I say is material culture. It means what? Well, we in the area of the study of technology uh, and society, we had been uh, discussing forever the issue of technological determinism or social determinism. Is internet determining society or is society determining internet? Well, frankly speaking, as in all cases of uh, in the history of technology, is both. It's both because technology is society. It's not something that is here technology and here is society and they don't touch each other. Certainly, uh, if you want to write a software program, you better don't think too much about society and you think about the logic of software. But if you want to know what this aware program is going to, to do and why you would uh, organize this architecture rather than the other, then maybe maybe you, you should also think about the, what's going to be uh, the development in technological terms. Meaning, uh, technology is one dimension of society and is fundamentally a cultural dimension of society, understanding culture in terms of sets of values and beliefs that inform behavior, because all technologies are very malleable. People throughout history appropriate technology and do with technology things that the technology has never thought about. Fortunately, imagine it would be otherwise. Uh, the social history of the telephone that is there, that has been uh, wonderfully researched, particularly in this country, uh, is a key example in why the telephone was supposed to do things that ultimately people didn't do, did other things. Uh, mainly, they talked to each other. I mean, uh, seems obvious, but that was not supposed to be what would be happening with the telephone, first of all. Um, so, the internet, in that sense, is particularly, particularly malleable because it's a technology in which the users are the producers and have been throughout the history of the internet. If you take the, the history of major technological innovations in the internet after the setting up of ARPANET in 1969, was a long time ago, many of the applications from chat rooms uh, to email uh, to email list. Email today is about uh, roughly uh, countrywide uh, accounts for about 85% of the uses of the internet. Well, email was never designed by technology. It was developed by people just trying to find ways to communicate. Uh, people at that time in, in the science organization certainly, but later developed in the society at large. So in other words, uh, the internet has been essentially organized around People developing their needs, their uses, their values, and then using the internet and designing new applications, new technology, new forms or relating to the internet, which ultimately is the common ground of the internet. Well, since this uh, uh, is simply the, the conclusion, I want to, um, to come to, to the substance that leads to this conclusion. However, before that, I, I want to emphasize that without a given technology, certain uses cannot expand. So certainly, uh, Internet has been shaped by society and by producers, uh, by users producing the, the, the Internet. But on the other hand, without the Internet, many things would not have been possible. The, uh, concretely speaking, the Internet has existed for a long time, since 1969 was ARPANET operational. But it only developed basically in the 1990s on a mass scale. Why? Well, first we needed a user-friendly technology, the World Wide Web, which, again, by the way, was developed by uh, um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, working, uh, doing it in his spare time in his job, uh, and, and actually mm, was under threat of being fired uh, if he did continue to do that at, at the CERN, the major uh, physics research center in Europe, and he was supposed to be dealing with the documentation, not by the designing programs for the internet. Um, so we did need that much that uh, friendly technology, but we also needed the formation of a mass market that led to a commercial interest in developing and selling internet and the internet applications. But for a mass market to emerge, you need a social and culturally induced demand. 
otherwise uh, would not be market or anything but for that matter. So what happened was that there was an economic, social and cultural demand because networking as a form of social and economic organization became critical in the 19, late 1980s and 1990s for reasons that had nothing to do with technology of the internet. So the emergence of the network business model, the emergence of networking in terms of social interaction, the emergence of a new culture based on individualism but not isolated individualism, individualism related to each other. Uh, the emergence of a global communication system, the emergence of a global political system interacting with each other. All these fundamental transformations of society, which I, that's what my trilogy was about, was the emergence of what I call the network society. The network society therefore created an extraordinary demand for a networking technology that happened to be the internet. But without the existence and development of the networking technology, this network society maybe would have not been shaped and formed completely. You see, that's what I mean by material culture. Now let's see, uh, so ultimately what developed was the internet as a platform for networking in chosen time, from the global to the local, from the local to the global, that is what I called years ago, from the local to the global in all dimensions of society. Now, let's try to see the evidence of this. Start with sociability. Sociability has indeed been uh, largely um, influenced by uh, the Internet. But the data on this are uh, very conclusive. I, I must say that in addition to all the uh, data I cited, uh, I, uh, last year I, I had the opportunity to do something uh, which I have not seen uh, because I was provided with substantial resources and very good research team, that is to have a representative sample with survey analysis of an entire population, the population of Catalonia. So I did uh, spend my great sabbatical year that was supposed to rest uh, in, in Barcelona uh, doing this survey of 3,000 uh, households face-to-face um, -face interview represented the sample of the entire population, which for the first time, therefore, we had an exhaustive study of Internet in which we take everybody, not just people using the Internet. Because if you only analyze people using the Internet, you never know if they do what they do because of the Internet or for something else. So one-third, in the case of Catalonia, one-third of people are Internet users, two-thirds are not, and therefore we were able to analyze the entire society and place in that society the Internet so measuring with the usual statistical techniques a number of processes. Uh, again, I, I think we should push into this direction uh, and, and make society aware that understanding uh, what is the relationship between technology and society has to be analyzed empirically and then we can think and develop all kinds of theories. So based on both the evidence I uh, mentioned to you uh, in my note and then uh, on this survey, we don't find anywhere that the Internet leads to increase in isolation, controlled by all kind, all kind of variables you want. On the contrary, it in fact enhances sociability, and sociability, the sociability in our society, in, in society where the Internet is widely diffused, uh, is always now sociability which is offline and online, in different proportions for different purposes. So this is not very exciting, but takes us away from the notion that people are alienated, isolated, etc., on the contrary, that people are uh, communicated uh, all the time. Now, but we have found a new form of sociability emerging as the predominant pattern of sociability, different of what was in the mature industrial society. This is what people like Barry Wellman or uh, Wayne Baker or myself uh, have called network individualism. So, on the one hand, Society, our societies are increasingly based on the interests and strategies of the individual. And again, this is not something that happened one day, some people decided that they wanted to be individual. This is rooted, structurally inscripted in the conditions of work, in the conditions of 
urbanization in the conditions of media development. That is, the individual at the center maybe was part of the American society from the beginning, but was certainly not part of other societies in Europe or Latin America. And now everywhere, the individual is the unit. But again, not the isolated individual, not the Robinsonian myth, but the network individual. And in that sense, uh, Internet is extremely powerful because it allows people to be themselves and not alone, precisely. It's not an instrument of alienation or isolation. It's an instrument of sociability, respecting the individuality of uh, people. And that is not uh, my theory. This is what the data show uh, everywhere literally everywhere. I would say that in addition to the Internet, what in, other, in, in more developed societies than the United States, where they have mobile, mobile phones, uh, this uh, also, um, uh, when you have a, a mass phenomenon of mobile phone use, this also is an extremely powerful instrument of network individualism. I think mobile phone uh, uh, diffusion in California is about 50%. Barcelona is about 77%, so there you start seeing the transformation of the culture, uh, and you can see also the beginning of what could be the constant online interaction. To give you an example, what we have observed is that patterns of personal interaction and sociability are certainly connected to family structure, to spatial organization, to culture. Uh, so internet impacts differently and mobile phone impact differently. In Catalonia, people use as much, uh, young people, young people, not the population, use internet as much as in California. But they don't, they spend much more time actually meeting physically and having personal interaction than online. The proportion online offline is much greater in, in North America than in Catalonia. Uh, and this is related to the pattern of, uh, not only of traditional culture, but to the pattern of residence. They don't have to jump on a car and drive. Uh, they, they can just start walking, meaning start walking. The pattern we have found is young people, let's say in their 20s, uh, start walking in the street and then while walking call to see they, who they found, who they can find. And then uh, whoever comes first, and then depending on, on, on the direction of the walk, you meet, okay? Uh, well, uh, so internet is important to keep going. Internet in California is important to set up the appointment. So, so you see, so the pattern of sociability is always mixed, it's never isolation, but the uses of the technology depend on the cultural, residential, and uh, traditional pattern of behavior in each society. So virtual communities do exist, but there are special forms of communities which are not, they don't have to follow the same rules than physical communities. And most of the patterns we observe everywhere are hybrid patterns of social communication. So that's one thing. Sociability, what we know now, is development, not the end of sociability, the development of a new form of sociability which is based on offline and online network individualism. On business, now also we know a number of things that uh, a few years ago in the middle of the um, financial fantasies of the internet uh, bubble, uh, we were not able to see. What we now know is that um, there was, uh, that the internet relationship to business was not about dot com. Uh, dot com were interesting experiences, main, most of them economic fantasies, but always in the, uh, already in the, 19, uh, in the late 1990s, the proportion of uh, commercial transactions of the Internet uh, was about 80% uh, B2B, business to business, 20% B2C. Now the proportion is 85% uh, uh, B2B. Um, so that's what it is. Internet has been a tool of transformation of management in the company, of the relationship between the company and other companies, internally in the company, companies and consumers, companies and suppliers. Uh, that's what really is, has been essential and has been a dramatic transformation on, on the matter, but not uh, the dot-com. 
Um, what we know is that what is critical about the internet uses in, in business is, and about the new economy by the way, is the impact on productivity. Uh, we know that there is a new economy because we have had sustained productivity growth in all the major economies, and particularly in the United States, directly related to the combination of organizational transformation and ICT use. The two things together, one without the other doesn't work. Um, this year, uh, in, the, in the middle of a uh, downturn, Productivity in the United States is increasing at an average uh, of over 5% per year. Remember the great, the, the years uh, between the mid-1970s and mid-1990s, productivity growth in this country was about 1.6% per year. So, now, in uh, the, the late 2001, in the middle of the downturn, productivity was already growing at between 4 and 6%. Now, what does it mean in, in standard economic theory? If productivity grows during a decline with an economic downturn, means that there are basic sources of productivity growth in the economy that do not depend on the relationship to the market, the standard economic theory. Um, so that's why Greenspan has kept uh, saying, well, there's something else than the dot-com. There's really a new economy because of the productivity, and he has the best productivity and analysis team in the Federal Research Board, and that's why he has been always saying the new economy is here as a serious matter, not because of technology per se, not of internet, but because of the transformation of the productivity function on the basis of both organizational restructuring, human and human resources development, and the uses of ICT. What happened with the, uh, B2, with the B, <coughs> B2C, with the dot com, is simply in addition to the hype provoked by uh, consultants and financial analysts, is they basically had, from the very beginning, the wrong business model. For a reason that you in this school know very well, but most people didn't in uh, the business world, that Internet is not like television. And they, uh, for a very simple reason, let's uh, worship our all great founder, McLuhan. Um, television is cool, internet is hot. As simple as that. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, and therefore, the idea that you would finance internet.com with advertising, as if it were television, was plain stupid. Uh, so this is, has nothing to do with internet hype, it has to do with human stupidity and not measuring basic things before investing billions of dollars. That's what happens with a rich country. And be careful, this rich school now. Uh, when you have a lot of money, you, you don't think too much about the spending it, okay? Being, that's my deepest felt uh, advice. Uh, be tougher than ever. Uh, because uh, it's critical that, that we don't do what we did in this country in the last decade in which everything, everything would go. Uh, remember that Stanford uh, closed down the, um, the class on the, master, in the MBA, uh, the class on uh, business plans, because no student would finish the class and therefore would not graduate because with the first business plan that they had, they would go out of the school and get $2 million to start. So uh, they had to close, to close down this. Um, now, interestingly enough, there is one exception in the dot-com world. There is one, well, there are companies that we all think ultimately will work out like Amazon. Uh, relatively good idea. I mean, it's not a good idea to sell other things than books, but books, yes. Um, I mean, it's a very bad idea to sell music, right? Uh, you know why? I mean, who, who cares about buying music? You can download everything. Um, but um, there's one company that is doing very well, a classic dot-com company, pure dot-com. Which one? eBay. eBay. And eBay is based on what? is not based on B2C, it's based on C2C. It's based on social interaction, a social space 
based on some form of trust that is more or less supported and regulated by uh, the company. So the company sells certification, basically, and people set up their own system and they always say, that works. That's a different model, you see? So we, we should learn something about this. As for um, productivity, it's really linked to the spread of the, what the model of, what a few years ago I proposed as the model of the network enterprise, an enterprise that is a network and connects to other networks and everything is a network. Well, um, this is really how the most productive and competitive enterprise in the world uh, work today. And because of uh, this competitiveness, the model diffuses because those uh, who do not adopt that then are phased out by competition. Um, just to fix you the ideas one second on this, um, I, I built the, the, the analysis on my study of the Cisco model and Dell and Nokia, etc. But for me, one of the most revealing case studies that convinced me about the network enterprise model was a, a company on a, which theoretically was not high tech by any means, which is actually a, a family owned at that time Spanish company, Zara, Z-A-R-A, -A, that if you don't know, you should. Uh, because it's now uh, number two in the world in uh, pret a porter and just displaced Benetton and it's only, uh, the only competitor is Gap. Uh, well, Sara did it with uh, marketing savvy and the internet and telephone communication also, but uh, with a very simple idea. Fashion is on real time. So you need to build up a system worldwide in which you know every day what is really the fashion in your uh, segment of the market. How do you know that? There's only one way. It's not what marketing experts think. It's only one real way with hard evidence. It's what people buy. What people buy every day in their 1,000 stores in the world. So what they have is everywhere a uh, system in which the, 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 the vendor, the seller, uh, has a uh, handheld little computer that any sale is beamed to the computer of the store and every day the computer of the store beams to the central uh, computer in Galicia of all places uh, near La Coruña. And then there they said fully automated design department, which I have uh, visited and worked on, uh, with 500 designers that design in real time, adjust in real time, and this goes automatically to the laser cutting machines in the factories uh, around the air that goes into a fully automated transportation system that sells, uh, that sends immediately all over the world with the tag in the, in the, uh, in the dress or in the shirt, uh, the tag already says which, which store in Tokyo or New York or Paris is going to receive that particular shirt. We using that, they have uh, been able to uh, produce, uh, to have a turnaround, that is from the moment they design a model to the moment that is in a store in New York, uh, is two weeks, two weeks. Therefore, they have 12,000 new models per year, and the um, summer collection, they design it in June. What about that? Uh, with the fashion was always based on you prepare three months later, you don't know, uh, at that time there was no major global climate change, so you, you think that you could uh, program for the summer uh, without knowing the temperature in the summer and so on. No, these people can input the global climate change in, in June or July. Uh, so this is to say that uh, the example of uh, network enterprises now dots the entire uh, realm of business. Um, all, so productivity is not simply a function of the macroeconomy, it's generated at the level of business. We also know now more in detail uh, the geography of the internet. Um, we know that again here, remember the, all the predictions by great futurologists of great prestige, um, that because of the internet, we all will live in the top of a mountain on with our little house in the prairie, and uh, we wouldn't have to do anything, no commuting, no commuting. Uh, 
uh, and, and everything would be done online and that's it? Well, what we have observed, was, as you know, so two things. And the general terms, we are in the largest process, largest wave of urbanization in human history. We just passed the threshold of 50% of the population on the planet being urban. Uh, the projection for uh, 2030 is about uh, 60%, uh, 65, and certainly before the end of the century, because it's simply demographic projection, it's not uh, nothing else, uh, over 80%. So we are going to a totally urbanized planet, uh, regardless of we like it or not. So we rather start thinking about what we do with, with these cities, but certainly it's increasing concentration. Then, the Internet, surprise, surprise. The Internet, one, is the most concentrated industry in the world. Uh, if you measure statistically, as uh, one of my doctoral students, Matsuk, did, he did his dissertation on a global sample of Internet domains, representatively, representative sample, you have to do that. Huh? Uh, so, he, and he mapped the Internet domains uh, throughout the planet and the evolution over time. So they are extremely concentrated by country, by region, by uh, metropolitan area, and within the metropolitan area, uh, in small s uh, segments of the metropolitan area. Like in New York, 80% of the internet domains are in the lower tip of Manhattan. Okay? Uh, so, and therefore, the, the industry is concentrated, but the, the Internet is concentrated for very simple reasons. Information processing and information generation is highly concentrated, more than anything else. But at the same time, the ability of using the Internet allows very distant places to be connected throughout the planet, throughout the country, and throughout the region. So the spatial architecture that has emerged is neither one of concentration or sprawl and dispersion, but Guess what? An architecture of networks under nodes. That is, we have major metropolitan centers throughout the world connecting with each other, absorbing more and more population and activities in these mega regions, and at the same time working as a unit in real time throughout the planet because of internet capability. Okay? Again, you, you, one had to, to do the actual work of analyzing all this. was not evident at the beginning. Uh, Fifth, we also know now more about the digital divide. Uh, the digital divide, remember, every time everyone would mention how important is the Internet, immediately the notion of yes, but most people will be excluded. This is increasing inequality in society. Uh, people don't, uh, will be marginalized, etc. Well, yes and no. Um, first of all, in terms of access, of actual access to the Internet, most of the cleavages of the digital divide are largely overcome after a level of diffusion. For instance, the gender gap. That was one of the things that rightly so people were worried about. Well, more women than men are online now in the United States and in Western Europe. Uh, and, and in Scandinavia, which is the other major diffusion rate. Um, the education gap, yes, uh, it's there. But in terms of access, access, not, not intensity of use, is also diminishing very rapidly. Uh, the um, age gap is also dwindling uh, in, in the United States. That is after a rate of diffusion of over 50%. The, the gap that is still there in, the, in this country is the ethnic racial gap. The still ethnic, uh, I mean, concretely speaking, African Americans and uh, Hispanics are still uh, disproportionately represented in the use. But the speed of change is changing too. That is, 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 uh, is increasing too. That is, is uh, m le the gap is low, is, is, is shrinking. The gap is not increasing, it's shrinking. Now, but we have a second uh, level. Access, yes, but then quality of access, broadband. Well, yes, broadband has more social inequality uh, because it's more expensive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in fact, uh, in major metropolitan areas, both the United States and and, and Europe, uh, most of the broadband capacity is remains unused. 
is not used. We have more broadband than we need. It doesn't mean that everybody who needs broadband has it, uh, but it means that overall there is a large uh, lack of utilization of broadband for reasons that I will come to in my conclusion on policy. Um, so, the, the, the gap in terms of broadband could be significant, but is not, because m most people don't need bro broadband. And the people who do need broadband, business, uh, high-level professionals, have it. Uh, then a third major digital divide has emerged. But this is the one that people are not talking about. This is the digital divide in terms of once you are in the internet, once you use widely the internet, what to do with it? That is, then the people who know, not technically, but culturally, intellectually, analytically, that know where, what to do with it, which kind of information they need, where to find it, and how to process and combine this information in knowledge and in knowledge that is applicable to, a spe to the specific projects and goals, that capacity is a culturally induced capacity. It's an educationally induced capacity. So the education gap and the cultural gap that always has been fundamental in all societies is extraordinarily amplified by the internet because is an extraordinarily powerful instrument if you know what to do with it, how to use it, and for what to use it. If you simply play video games, then you go backwards. Um, the real meaning of the digital divide is at this point, besides this, what I just said, which I think is still there and is important, is mainly uh, at the level of the planet. If we consider the Internet as the backbone and the material infrastructure for everything we do in society, the fact that uh, in uh, the developing world uh, there is no, um, particularly in, in Asia and Africa, Internet has a still a very limited use. Everybody talks about the rapid diffusion of Internet in China. Sure. From in five years, from about 1 million people to 30, 35 million people depending. Okay, 35 out of 1.3 billion, okay? Uh, and the same thing for India. Uh, so rates of growth and proportion is substantially different. Um, there is great disparity between countries in Latin America and so on, but overall, in the planet as a whole, internet diffusion it reaches at this point about 7% of uh, people in the planet are connected, while uh, in North America, uh, Northern Europe, we uh, have gone over 55%, and in spite of the fact that the rate of uh, diffusion has slowed recently. But the main issue of this digital divide, as I will also try to, to, to say in my conclusion, is that even if we would have uh, if we would develop an internet infrastructure in the developing world, as the United Nations is trying to do, and as I'm trying at this point, being one of my commitments, uh, but uh, we will see that without a number of institutional, social, and cultural transformation, it's not much use to develop uh, internet infrastructure if this does not go along with education, with development of human resources, with applications that are specific to what developing countries need. So uh, this is still, the, the digital gap is not, cannot be seen simply in terms of internet, has to be seen in terms of the gap in cultural and educational capabilities and in development opportunities. Everybody was thinking also that internet would transform politics and then finally we would have this dream democracy. Well, great surprises here too. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the least diffuse uses of internet in the public sector, in, in public interest activities, is in 
government and democratic participation. Um, most political institutions, uh, most politicians have used the internet as a one-way billboard, uh, usually to solicit campaign contributions. And very little interaction that goes beyond what used to be uh, the interaction in terms of writing letters or giving telephone calls, actually less than with telephone calls. Uh, there was a very interesting study uh, actually coordinated by from a professor of this school, Bill Dutton, on the uses of internet in parliaments around the world, and uh, the record is quite appalling, is practically no use except bureaucratic use. Uh, experience of citizen participation at the local le level that were very important in the uh, early 1990s have basically disappear in most places, and people have appropriated individually the internet, but internet in formal institutional politics is rarely used. It's uh, truly a secondary aspect of uh, the technological transformation of our society. This certainly is not the fault of the internet, it's the fault of the political crisis we are living in terms of legitimacy and lack of citizen participation. On the other hand, what the internet has become absolutely crucial is in social movements. That is in everything that is building social, cultural, and political autonom autonomy throughout the society. I have been studying with some of students the anti-globalization movement in these last years, uh, one of the most important and influential movements nowadays. Well, the anti-globalization movement is entirely based on the internet, has no formal structure, has no real connection. It lives on two things. It lives on the media and on the internet. On the media, very simple, you wait until there is a major global event, the meeting of some important people somewhere, you show up there, and the media offer you the best platform in the world. Uh, and on the other hand, you debate, you organize, you coordinate toward these actions on the basis of the Internet. More than that, uh, some uh, the current debates in the anti-globalization movement uh, are linked to a strong new anarchist current. Uh, I know that in America anarchists have a bad name, but in Catalonia not. Uh, uh, but uh, there are anarchists and anarchists, you know. It's, uh, there are some very bad anarchists and, and some uh, interesting anarchists. Uh, so, but the notion here, which of course is utopian, I would never propose it myself, but the notion in this current is that democracy is so emptied that we have betrayed so much the institutions of political democracy that they think, in fact, like Californians, meaning government is no good except to protect us from terrorists. Um, remember that all the opinion polls on California government, the legitimacy of the California politicians or political institutions had been already for at least five, six years uh, absolutely at the bottom of prestige, including the 1992 and 2000 um, uh, poll of the Field Institute of the Public Policy Institute of California showed one of the questions is uh, what do you think that your political leaders are? 39% of Californian voters said they are crooks. Crooks is the word they use. Uh, one of the alternatives that was, are they crooks? And they put it just in case. 39% said, yeah, they are crooks. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't think they are crooks, uh, but they are not doing a very good job at demonstrating that they are not crooks. So under such conditions, what the, uh, this new anarchist current uh, proposes is the referendum California politics all the way. How you have a constant governance, governance process through referendum through the internet. You build a network, uh, you create a series of people simply mediating the debate and then taking votes, and then you dissolve all the institutions and you keep going by the internet. Well, we, we all know how utopian it is, but the simple, well, they're taking this very seriously. It's not just a few people. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people uh, along these lines. Uh, the notion that this could be seriously debated shows to some extent that the attempt to appropriate this powerful communication on real-time technology to rebuild institutions of formal debate and representation to some way. So, so there is this notion there, and there is this tension. Remember, utopias always become ultimately downgraded, filtered, betrayed, ultimately had something to do with the institutions we built. 
uh, the founding fathers also started with utopias in America at that time. And this leads me to not politics but government in the internet, the relationship between internet and government. Well, this relationship between government and the internet since the very beginning of the internet has been a relationship of love and hate. But the more the internet has developed is more hate than love. Uh, I had been in many government uh, committees in different countries in which the first thing any government representative thinks about the internet how to control it. So it has developed uh, over time what I call the China syndrome. The China syndrome is let's use the internet for business and education and not for letting people do whatever they want with the internet. And the system has to be a system in which we control the people on some things and then you have to be good citizen, be productive, be educated, be informed, but then don't decide by yourself. This is the China syndrome. And if you go over this, we'll repress you. Well, repress you is not so easy. It's not so easy. Uh, without opening the entire debate, I will remind you that in this country, after repeated attempts by the Clinton administration to uh, install some form of censorship on the Internet, at that time was child pornography the main issue, the, um, the American courts, and, and backed by the Supreme Court, had repeatedly defended freedom of expression in the Internet. So you cannot do it in the United States. Um, so, and because you cannot do it in the United States, and it's always some way to go through the backbone, uh, the internet backbone in the United States, is no way you actually can interrupt the message under the current conditions. Under the current conditions, I, I insist. Uh, but you can, you can know who did it. You can go to the IPS and control, and so you can not stop the message, but kill the messenger. Well, you are the messenger, it's significant. Uh, <laughs> but if you are the message, no. Uh, you reroute. Uh, you, you reroute on a trail of bodies, and, but that's how history changes, right? Um, so, fundamentally, there is this tension and this contradiction. Once you, you let the Internet go, it's going to be very difficult, as Singapore, as China, uh, as other people. Now, on the other hand, um, the Internet is a glass house. Anyone wanting to check on the internet knows. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, John McNeely, uh, sorry, Steve McNeely was um, uh, right saying privacy, there's no more privacy on the internet, get over it. Okay? Um, well, the point is that, of course, uh, there are laws still in this country and other countries. So get over it means no, get to the court, uh, because uh, if you are not supposed to be spied, uh, we still live in democratic societies that are supposed to protect our privacy. Now the complicated issue is that most of the uh, information gathered on you from the web and from your credit card is by commercial companies. So my point has been over all these last years that the problem was not mainly with Big Brother, with, was with little sisters, many little sisters, uh, uh, that all were retrieving your information, putting cookies, uh, doing whatever, um, and you not knowing. And that, but also this is legislation. The European Union had a different policy on this. In the case of the United States, the legislation has always been: you have the you user have to actively say, "No, I don't want your cookie." In the case of the European Union, you have to say actively, yes, I want your cookie. Okay, well, therefore, the same problem, technically speaking, culturally speaking, the legal and institutions and the institutional framework makes all the difference in the world. Uh, now, however, the problem now is that while I was downplaying years ago the danger of Big Brother, now I don't. And I don't because of the current developments in the Homeland Security Act and the great idea by Poindexter um, to uh, link the, uh, the data bank of all commercial companies with all government companies, so sorry, agencies, 
and have this data bank uh, monitored and controlled by government without any of us knowing anything, just in case we are terrorists. Uh, so this is a very serious development. It's an extremely serious development. Uh, and it's the first time, it's the first time uh, in the Western world, uh, China does this, but um, since they don't have so much information on commercial activities because people don't have much commercial activity on the internet, it's, it's less serious. But this is this could be the beginning that this is not a glass house, this is an iron cage. Uh, this could be the beginning of that. But again, this is not about the internet technology. It, this is about the relationship between government, society, and the uses of technology. What these issues of uh, privacy, freedom, and security are pointing out is a, a very fundamental contradiction between our institutions and the technology we have. In which sense? Well, one of the major problems, including uh, in terms of security for our whole system, is cyber terrorism or, or, or disruption of our uh, basic systems that are online. Cyber security is paramount at this point in many countries, and with serious reasons. Well, one of the ways in which this could be seriously diminished is the following. A network can never be fully protected simply by firewalls at the center of the network. We can connect, we can protect some key computers in the Pentagon, or, but the system that is the network of our society, the grid of information, is only as robust as every node in the network. Uh, as Microsoft, Microsoft has been repeatedly, repeatedly hacked and so we're stolen, etc., etc. It's always the same way. It's through some Microsoft engineer somewhere in the world that uh, uh, computes from home, and through that home you go through the Microsoft network. It's never the central Microsoft computer. So the issue, therefore, is to make the network robust everywhere, at the periphery of the network, not at the core of the network. And that's what? Well, to a large extent, that's cryptography. To a large extent, is the ability of people to encode their own messages. But, here is the contradiction. What would make people's privacy relatively preserved? If they want to crack your code, they will crack it. But if it takes too much, well, why to crack 10,000 codes per, per, per day? So, uh, only selective codes would be cracked. Therefore, for most people with cryptography, uh, their privacy would be protected and the network will be more robust in general. But cryptography means really that it's a, a degree, a great, much greater degree of freedom from private users vis-a-vis -vis government agencies. And that's something that all governments in the world all agree they don't want. And the, the Council of Europe last year issued a very strong statement saying that they were going to pursue cryptography, cryptography and cryptography rights to the last energy. Well, on the other hand, you can download PGP free from the internet. So they are going to check every computer. Uh, and on the other hand, there are all kinds of networks of hackers. Remember, crackers are the bad ones, hackers the good ones. Uh, I'm not saying the criminals. Uh, <clears throat> all kind of networks of, of hackers that already have engaged in a very interesting um, oppositional politics to ensure the freedom of the internet. So this is an open field of contested politics in society. So the technology is there, but the uses of the technology are contested in the ways I'm trying to say. Then. The key finding, in my opinion, on all our analysis, and before going in a second to the policy conclusion, but the key finding is that what Internet does in terms of society is not simply an instrument. It adds some specific dimension. I said networking. Networking is a very important one. But another one, which is autonomy building. Uh, societies evolve throughout most of the world toward project-based agents, individuals or collectives. When I talk about the anti-globalization movement, this is a collective, okay? 
When I talk about women movement, uh, when I talk about religion and religious movements, these are collectives. But they still are uh, project-based in terms of autonomy building. Let me just for one minute to be uh, a sociologist and uh, say what uh, I call autonomy. By autonomy, I concretely understand the individual capacity, individual but could be a collective, to act according to one's interests and values independently of institutional rules and organizational norms. Okay? So, well, uh, because I had the ability to do this uh, design survey uh, in on, on the Catalan society, I could actually measure that. Uh, and I measure the, uh, the, the way in which uh, Internet supports or does not support autonomy building. Uh, for this, of course, first you have to start measuring autonomy uh, in the sense I defined. Uh, we did measure autonomy, and then empirically we had many indicators, both of attitudes and behavior, and, pra and collective practices, and we did the typical factor, factor analysis, and from this factor analysis we emerged four main factors that led to four um, types of autonomy building, empirically speaking, that were one was a project of personal autonomy, including the entrepreneurial mentality, that is, I control my life. Second, a project of sociopolitical autonomy, that is, citizen participation, indexes of sociopolitical participation and sociopolitical mobilization. A third, what became quite important, was the project of controlling my body, health control. I want to give you an example of people who check systematically their, prescrip their medical prescriptions. Uh, to see really what the doctor gave them is what they should take. Um, and fourth, maybe of your interest, a project of communication autonomy, uh, meaning measured by distrust on the mass media. So the, the more you distrust the mass media, the more autonomous you are. Okay? That's the, the, the notion. That's why I never put value judgments. Uh, maybe it's very bad to be autonomous in, in that case, but uh, anyway. Uh, if, now, what we showed empirically is that the four projects, which are independent, is not the same individuals, okay? The four projects, people who are on one are not on the other, okay? They are independent. The four projects of, of autonomy are systematically correlated with the use of Internet, using or not use, and with the intensity of the use of the Internet, positively correlated in every case. For instance, in terms of communication, the more you distrust communication media, the more you use the internet. Sounds logical, but some people were saying the opposite, that this would actually accumulate. It doesn't mean that if you use the internet, you don't trust the media. Uh, it, it, it means exactly what I said. The more you distrust the media, the more you use the internet, because you try to find alternative sources of information and communication. Now, the, the, the notion also was, can we then try to measure uh, the feedback effect. Is that by using the internet you become more autonomous? Well, this is difficult to do, of course, because of the temporal sequence matter, but we could do it on one, at least on one ground. Uh, we took people who had the internet only in the last two years and tried to see if uh, in the last two years they have uh, received a professional promotion or started the business. Okay? So that that's relatively solid because then you really can have the, the temporal sequence. And we found that uh, comparatively to those who did not have the internet in the in the same two years, they were more promoted and more entrepreneurial. Okay? And not in terms of attitude but in terms of what actually happened in the life. So it looks like Autonomous people use the internet, the use of the internet, of the internet reinforces their autonomy and their capacity to implement their projects. So autonomy building seems to be one of the critical matters of the internet, uh, both individually and collectively. Uh, so the internet in fact seems to erode 
the state and large corporations, the traditional structures of authority, not in itself, not because it's a technology, but because, this is what I describe very close in my book, but that I told you this three years ago, so you should know, um, uh, that because it was created by a culture of freedom. I have not insisted here in this because an analysis of history was three years ago. It was created deliberately by libertarians, even if they were Defense Department libertarians, which is, exists in this country, we have everything. Um, and therefore, this culture of freedom amplified itself in the material culture of the Internet as a technology enhancing and favoring autonomy building. Therefore, what I come to is that there is an increasing contradiction between the culture of security that emerges in our society and the culture of freedom, between the culture of entrepreneurialism and the control of this entrepreneurialism by global financial networks. There is both a political and economic contradiction around the uses of Internet as autonomy building and at the same time being resisted and controlled by both large corporations and uh, the authorities of the state. And then I, I end with uh, my policy conclusion. There has been in recent um, um, times, in the last two years, uh, what some people call the crisis of the Internet. The crisis of the Internet is not simply the crisis of the dot-com, it's also that actually the, the, the rate of diffusion has slowed in the last two years. Uh, again, here the futurology, we're projecting an exponential growth forever. No. Well, first, it has decreased because of obvious reasons. You penetrate less developed societies, you penetrate less educated segments of the population, it's normal that the rate of growth decreases. But apparently it's more than that. Um, it is that the Internet was always, always from the beginning, a social space and a working tool, more than a commercial space. Then, in the 1990s, was an attempt to bring the Internet mainly into money-making operations and into business operations, which fits some, in some cases, fits business. Business has very much taken advantage of this for very productive uses. But on the other hand, move Internet away from the, in, the uses of Internet in the public interest and as a social space. And people, in fact, when you look at what they do, they use the Internet for connecting with each other, for entertainment, uh, but much less than thought, much less. Uh, porno, less than 10% on a regular basis. Um, then, for education and for information retrieving about their basic needs. Health, for instance, uh, relationship to public administration, to government, but just the things that people value most in their relationship to the Internet, except for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship, this, there is no supply. There is demand, but there is no supply. Government services, health services, education services are the least developed areas of the Internet. Uh, for instance, last year we did a, a, a little uh, study that ended in policy, for the European Commission, the European Commission decided in April to set up a new Europe 2005 Action Program on the Information Society that is built around three priorities, which resulted from our study. Uh, E-learning, E-health, E-government. These are the three priorities, which happen to be the largest employers in all countries, uh, the uses that people value most in their daily life and where the Internet is least developed. Now, it's least developed, why? Because the transformation of these education, health and government services requires an organizational transformation, requires an institutional transformation, has to bump many vested interests and actually means the reform of the public sector in every country, which we know is one of the most difficult things to do. So, for instance, e-learning requires the transformation of the school. 
uh, e-learning requires, for instance, that universities start understanding that what you do here, what we do in Berkeley, is not the only thing universities can do, because in the kind of society we are, we are in the process of lifelong learning. And how you keep learning once you are already in the job uh, market or in your professional life. So the critical notion of lifelong learning is directly connected to the development of mass e-learning, not as an alternative to current education, but as a very important and powerful complement to the current educational system. So all these issues, in fact, demand the recognition of uh, the public uses of society, the capacity of horizontal networking as a key organizational change, and the uh, authorization by society to the process of autonomy building. Why health is not being developed in the internet? Why health services are not developed in the internet? Because this transforms fundamentally the relationship between doctors and their patients. Because self-organization of patients runs against the tradition, the witchcraft tradition from throughout history, in which the doctor knows you shut up. Uh, but then when the first thing you arrive when you arrive uh, to see your doctor is, what's happening to you? Okay? So the what's happening to you means that much of the information comes from you. Then, of course, it's processed and analyzed scientifically, and I would never uh, self-diagnose, uh, but uh, the relationship completely changes is it is simply a one-to-one -one relationship or it's a much more complex segment of relationship. In other words, transforming uh, the technology of um, the health sector is transforming the relationship between people, their bodies, their doctors, and their hospitals. So I would say that the crisis that we are seeing nowadays in the internet and of the internet economy is the crisis of a society that has now the tools for its freedom, a society that has a culture of creativity and autonomy, but limits the uses of freedom to the market and relies on institutions that are still based largely on vertical hierarchies. And the Internet by itself cannot change society, but being a material culture, a culture that was inscripted as culture of freedom and autonomy, cannot live and expand without an institutional transformation that finally yields to the search in innovation in both culture and technology. Thank you for your attention. That was excellent. Thank you so very much. What we're going to do now is open up the floor for questions, and we have people with microphones. And I want you to raise your hand, and we're going to pass the microphone to you because this is being taped. And webcast, that's right. Okay. Manuel, first let me congratulate you on an excellent and very stimulating um, um, lecture. Uh, two questions, um, both having to do with the possibility of social dislocation. Uh, first, uh, possibly more prosaically, you talked about um, uh, the increase in productivity associated with the Internet. Uh, you talked about Zara and how much more quickly that Spanish company moves. And, and I wonder if you see a decrease in jobs um, in significant sort of societal level numbers as a consequence of the introduction of this um, new technology. Secondly, on a global scale, you talked about diffusion rates across the planet. Do you see, shall we say, northern and western countries, North America, uh, northern Europe, getting what is effectively um, a an advantage which cannot be overcome. And then the higher level question is your your concept of, of the networked in, networked individualism. Do you see that as supporting the pursuit of the common good, that that historic notion, or being contrary 
to the pursuit of the common good and a greater increase on individual well-being. Thank you. Great point. Uh, <clears throat> on the first one, <clears throat> is really an empirical matter. Uh, as you can imagine, has been all kind of discussions under for studies in the last 10 years about the effects of information technology on jobs. Here's the record, and this is really a record because now we know enough. Uh, on the <clears throat> for the developed countries, uh, there is no destruction of uh, jobs uh, overall in aggregate uh, by by technology. On the contrary, it's a positive it's a positive correlation between technological development, diffusion of, of technology, and of the quality of jobs. However, um, it's clear that if you uh, introduce robots in an automobile assembly line, uh, this eliminates jobs in that particular assembly line. And if these uh, workers are not retained and do something else, uh, then for these workers, uh, they go into long-term unemployment. And this has happened in a number of countries, including this country. But at the same time, you generate more jobs, you generate even higher quality jobs. The problem is that what is nice in terms of the aggregate statistics, the economy is doing better, for a specific people in the thousands or, or tens of thousands is not a good deal. Because again, they, they are the problem. And, and so a number of countries in the European Union, for instance, have ensured that either this Finland, for instance, uh, either these people are retained or they, they are too old for that, well, they have very decent early retirement. Uh, in the United States, we have not been, done this. On the contrary, uh, if you lose your job when you are 50, you are in deep trouble. Uh, so that, that's what I, I would say. At the level of the world, uh, it's even more, um, uh, more clear that lack of technological development is not the only consideration, but lack of technological development uh, destroys the economy and destroys jobs. Uh, most of the growth of, uh, of jobs in <clears throat> Latin America or Asia, uh, sorry, or Africa uh, in the last 10 years has been in the urban informal sector. Uh, if I take a city that is the uh, manufacturing hub of Latin America, Sao Paulo, about 45% of, of the labor force of Sao Paulo is in the urban informal sector. Uh, on the other hand, there has al also been a rise in manufacturing jobs. But one of the things that people don't know is that we, we think manufacturing is finished, right? That there's no more manufacturing jobs. If we take the planet, we are the highest peak of manufacturing jobs in history, except that they are in China. Uh, they are in China, they are in India, they are in Mexico, they are in a number of places. So you have, the more a country links to the global economy, modernizes, introduces technology, the more you create jobs. Uh, the critics of the anti-globalization movement uh, relate to what happens to the rest of, of the society. So we have this process of tremendous uneven development between very modern sectors. You had the Bangalores of the world. Bangalore is splendid at this point, but India is not. Uh, I mean, most of India is still a very rural, rural, poor country uh, with desperate poverty and increasing inequality. Uh, so that, that's the critique. The critique is not, as people say, against manufacturing in the, in the third world. The critique is manufacturing, they are all right, but then this sector gets connected to the global economy and two-thirds of the society are excluded before there was some internal coherence. Now what is accumulated in the core sector is enough to feed the elites, the upper segment of the population, and goodbye to the rest. See, that, that's exactly the point. It's the shift, what I, I call, we had a, a little book with uh, uh, the, the now president of Brazil for still uh, one month, Fernando Cardoso, in, in, we are good friends from many years ago, and in our book we said, well, uh, what we are observing now is the end of the good old times of exploitation. Old times, because we are shifting for many people in the world from being exploited to being structurally irrelevant. And being irrelevant is much worse because you can be ignored. If you are exploited, this is social relations if you fight. If you are irrelevant, you don't exist. And that is, in my opinion, that the, 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 critical, the critical matter. As <clears throat> For um, uh, wait a second. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. The, um, so 
network individualism applies to both individuals and collective actors. <clears throat> okay? It applies to churches. It applies to so what, what I'm saying is that this network individual is that people connect to each other on the basis of their project. But for reasons which are not the technology, we do, I mean, uh, Wayne Baker, just uh, one of the uh, leaders of the Service Center of the University of Michigan we were talking about before, I just finished a, a book that's not published yet on the transformation of American values in the last uh, 10 years based on, on, on hard data and it's massive uh, shift toward individualism and toward a loss of the notion of the public good and of the commons. And it has to be because the, 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 the notion of public good and commons Ha, is related to the institutional political system. Uh, and it's, it's not, you are not simply for the commons in general, it's for the commons through the institutions. So if, as we know, in the whole world, there is a deep crisis of political legitimacy, and people don't trust their political leaders, therefore they don't trust the institutions, not because the institutions are bad. Uh, everybody still believes in democracy. Uh, most people, they still believe in democracy. But if the people who occupy the institutions are not trusted, why we, can we trust the institutions? And therefore, there is no common good, because I don't have the instruments to set up this common good. Therefore, I build my project, my life, etc. So, what I, I would say, although California has always been individualist, I think at this point, the California model of individualism is spreading throughout the world. And what was the common good approach in California is also being marginalized at this point. And, uh, sorry, and internet offers a very good instrument to that. Because you can be yourself and build your common on the internet. Okay, okay thank you very much for your nice uh, lecture. Um, I'm very interested in your concept of individual autonomy, and I'm especially interested in your explanation of the relationship between individual autonomy and the people's trust in the mass media. Uh, so I think um, I agree in your opinion that people who do not trust mass media institution has great individual autonomy and they have a greater success in their individual project. But at the same time, in the area of political communication, I think uh, there is uh, like uh, 30 years of research about the, the, the relationship between political participation and people's belief about political system efficacy, which is people's belief about how the political system works in their society. So if people believe that the political system such as the, uh, if, if people believe that public organizations such as government, mass media, don't work in the way that they should work, then people's political participation should decline. That's the, like, a firm result from political science. I think, uh, if the internet increased the uh, individual autonomy, and the individual autonomy is, has, a, has a negative relationship with the, uh, people's belief with, in the mass media organization, then you are in a, some kind of a paradoxical situation, which is the government helps to increase individual autonomy by providing more service on the internet, but at the same time providing them more service, according to your argument, can increase the distrust in the public opinion, uh, distrust in the mass public organizations. So which means that that can decrease political participation. So how do you think about this kind of a, a paradox? That's a very good uh, uh, point in the sense that you, you really bring together two things which are critical uh, because politics nowadays is mainly media politics. And it's really politics is played out in the space of the media by and large. Um, not only, but the most important uh, uh, playing. Now, uh, and you are pointed for, well, uh, people don't trust the media, don't trust the government, but still they participate politically. Well, first, they do not participate politically. Um, they, uh, in terms of the civic participation, in terms of the involvement in, in associations, there is, well, um, as, you, as, as you know, uh, in the United States, Putnam has uh, his famous book uh, showing that the massive decline of civic participation and this is verified uh, throughout Europe 
uh, in comparable terms. Um, but people, you are right, still vote, okay? Uh, well, first they don't vote much in the United States, uh, about 50, but they don't vote significantly less than, than they were citing, uh, although a little bit less, from 55 to 50 uh, or 51 in the presidential election. Uh, in the California elections, 30 percent, and local elections, 10 percent. So, uh, but in, in, in Europe, where there is also a crisis of political legitimacy, people st still vote, and vote in between seven, 60 and 75 percent. So it's, uh, however, why they vote? Because um, if they always think, I mean, all, all, the, all the polls show that people vote negatively more than positive. They vote against not for. Um, because if they don't vote against, then they have surprises, like in France last spring, uh, when the, the socialist electorate, disgusted with all parties, but also with the socialists, decided not to vote in the first round because they would have a second round, then they got a fascist uh, in number two and they eliminated the socialist candidate. Uh, well, I voted for Gray Davis, okay? Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's uh, to, to, to a large extent, uh, even if I am not totally convinced by the man, I still think it's much better than any other option. Uh, so that, that's why uh, I think it's, uh, people vote not necessarily with great enthusiasm, um, uh, so that in fact you could, um, you could uh, target the media as the, um, the ones who convey the message. I don't think that's, that's the case. I think uh, people do not follow politics or stop following, following politics because of the media say or don't. People have their own opinion in, in terms of what happened in their life, that's what we know in terms of the political uh, analysis of public opinion, and then the media convey the messages that help to shape that. But ultimately, people are not so easily manipulated. Remember, you are in the communication school. I always supported the theory of the interactive audience uh, by, by Russ Newman, etc. It's, uh, it's the notion that the audience is not stupid, that the audience interacts, models the media, etc. So what I, my point about the influence of media in politics is not the traditional radical view that the media tell people what to vote, how to behave. No. The media tell all kinds of things, and people make their own opinion in terms of their own experience. But the one thing that is decisive in the media is that what is not in the media does not reach people. So that's the boundary, that's the borderline. That's why it says the space of politics is not the tool, is not the, the, the power. I don't think media have power. They have extraordinary influence, which is a very different thing. So if you don't go into the media, then you don't exist in political terms. That, that would be my, my comment. I think we have time for one more. Oh, thank you, Professor, for a very interesting and comprehensive thank talk. My, my question concerns um, the comment that you made about the networking model being the killer application for the Internet in the uh, early 1990s. It would seem that the networking model of organization and the Internet's development or existence are not independent. Um, do you think there would have been this networking model adapted by business or even thought of by business if there weren't an Internet in the first place? Yeah, that's a, an excellent uh, observation because, in fact, and, and uh, maybe I, I didn't express myself clearly because, yes, I do think uh, that without the Internet, the networking model, and the network society as, as a whole would have much more difficulty in developing uh, in many ways. Would be a total obstacle? Well, it's difficult to say because, frankly, um, in business terms, EDS was there before the Internet and, 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 and networking was at that point. Uh, the Japanese company decided that fax would do it. Uh, certainly doesn't, but uh, they were building uh, the, some networks on, on fax and the global financial markets uh, develop uh, networks on the basis of other architecture of computer networking, uh, not only without the internet that still they don't use, but uh, without similar protocols. So um, I think the push toward networking was very strong and rooted in the evolution of the economy and society. But the internet was the precise platform through which 
all these could develop, expand, and become a network society. It's very much that capitalism without electricity still would have developed, but would be a very different capitalism. I know that we all feel fortunate to be here, and we want to continue the party, and I'd like to invite everybody up into the lobby for the reception. Thank you very much for joining us.